And uh, as we said, uh, the next talk will be peering into the process of code reviews. So I give a warm welcome to Mike Salander on stage. Welcome. Thanks. Hey guys, um, so it's really great to be here. It's actually the second time I've made it to Stockholm this year and the city just gets better every time we visit. So it's really awesome to be here and you guys have an amazing tech community. Like the size of Internet to Darna, it's like mind blowing, way bigger than any other stuff I've seen. So uh, my name is Mike. I'm a WordPress engineer at Human Made and we're here today to talk about code reviews and specifically pure code reviews. So the process of you know a constant peer review kind of integrated into a general workflow, like kind of the day-to-day -day thing. And so I wanted to talk about this, just a little intro, um, because at Human Made, every single line of code that we have goes through code review. And I've been developing for about six years now, but I've only been at Human Made for oh, six months, a year, something like that. And so moving into that process at first was really intimidating. Like I think code reviews for a lot of people can be a little scary when you look into it. Because as developers, we have a lot of ego, we have a lot of ourselves a lot of our self-purpose really wrapped up in the code we do. Like the work that I produce most days feels like my self-worth, feels like a lot of, of who I am. So to have someone come in and say, hey, this is wrong, this needs to be do, or you, know, you need to do this differently, this is wrong, um, inviting that in is very nerve-wracking, it can be a little scary. But what I found when I came to Human Made and started doing these code reviews, and like I said, every single line of code that we put out goes through these code reviews, is that there's a lot of benefits and there's a lot of um, just uh, basically really, really good pieces that come out of this. Like my personal development has accelerated tenfold in the time that we've started doing code reviews. And most of that is specifically because of those code reviews. So just kind of wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about that today, give you some practical tips, show you how we do it at Human Made, and hopefully you can walk away with some, uh, some good ways that you guys can integrate code reviews into your own process. But, since we have a really small room here, I'm gonna do a little informal poll, hope you guys are awake. Um, how many of you guys do code review like as a required piece of your process, like everything goes out? Or at least partial, either one. Most of the guys in the room, cool. Does anyone in here not do any code review? And it's totally okay to raise your hand. Yeah, a couple people? Cool, okay. Well, you're in the right room, this is good. <laughs> so, the first thing I wanted to talk about is why do code reviews? Like some of the benefits, some of the, the reasons that offset maybe some of those fears and, and some of that personal, uh, yeah, the scariness of code reviews and walking into that. And the first one and probably the most important one is that it saves money in the development process. And this probably seems a little counterintuitive, right? Because the number one complaint that most people have about code reviews when they don't want to do them is that it takes a lot of resources, takes a lot of time, takes developers off of actually building things. And all these sound very expensive. But the problem is that that's a, a relatively short-term kind of view. Because in, it's true, like in the short term, it does take resources, it does take a lot of time. But if you look at the long term, it ends up being way more expensive to not have a code review process and to catch bugs later on in the process. And that's kind of where this statistic comes from. Like it's 40 times expensive to fix a defect in production than it is to fix it in early development. So that means like a customer has found a bug, you have to go in, fix that bug, push it, do all the QA and everything in that. And the reason for that is because you end up involving like 10 times as many steps and processes to fix a bug that's already made it to a client site or to a deployed plugin or basically to a fully built product than you would to do it on early development. Like if you caught that bug in code review as you're building a feature. And if you look at that, so let's just like go through a really quick example of like what happens if a customer catches a bug. So first of all, the customer reports it and they're not happy, right? No customer really likes having bugs on their site or things go wrong. So they have to report it. Customer service catches that, verifies it, makes sure it looks okay. Then they have to push it down to a project manager or maybe a lead developer. Then that person has to schedule that with a developer. Let's say you have a, a relatively large team so they have to schedule that. Then that developer has to verify that bug, figure out what they wrote six months ago or a year ago, and heaven knows doing that on code that you wrote six months ago is never fun. So they have to figure out what they actually did, fix it, test it, push it to staging, QA verifies it, or maybe the customer verifies it. Then you actually push it live, and then customer service alerts the, the customer. Like, there's a lot of steps. There's a lot of stuff going on here, right? Like, a lot to do if you catch a bug really late. However, if you catch in development, the developer fixes it, right? 
I mean, there's one step as opposed to 11, because you caught it right then. The developer knows exactly what they wrote, so they're very familiar with that code that they just built and pushed. And they just fix it, and you push it on. You move on. Like That's the whole expense of catching that. So if you look at that long-term view, it's very inexpensive to catch these bugs later on. And then this one is probably my favorite. And this is a training and knowledge transfer aspect of code reviews. Because they're a very educational prospect or a process. And it's something that happens day in and day out. It's a constant learning. It's a constant training. And it's a constant, um, honestly, it's a constant team building thing. And like the reason that this is so cool is that you know, like conferences are great. And reading blogs and listening to podcasts and all of that, it's, it's exciting. It's good. You get a lot in a short amount of time. But there's only so much of that you can do. Like We can't go to conferences every day and still get paid to do our jobs. Um, but code review, because if you push everything through this code review process, every single day you're learning something new, or you're teaching something new, or you're training your developers in something, uh, something new and exciting. And this happens both ways. It's not like it's just from a senior down to a junior developer. Juniors can teach seniors, because we all have little gaps in our knowledge, little things that we haven't seen before. We all have little histories. So maybe everyone on your development team is about the same level. But because you come from different histories and different backgrounds and you have different passion projects, different interests, you can still train each other and teach each other just by doing code review and learn new things all the time. And then clients. This is a big one. Clients like bug-free sites. They generally don't like to see issues happening on their site or issues in a plugin that you push. And if you want a big client, a big enterprise level client, they're going to demand this kind of code review process. Like all clients are going to appreciate it because it's a quality indicator, right? And when you're pitching and when you're um, talking to a prospect or talking to a lead, and you can tell them that everything you do goes through code review, they're going to know that you care a lot about the quality of your code, about the quality of your sites, that you're willing to put so much resources into it. And it's a really good hook for them. But then the enterprise level clients are going to absolutely demand that and before you get an enterprise level client. And then it's, I think it's pretty evident by just this is a pretty random sampling of companies and just in the WordPress space that do required code reviews as a part of the process. And you have Automatic, XWP, I put Human Made, um, Delicious Brains, they do WP Migrate DB Pro, and Reactive Web Dev. Like this is a small sampling of the companies that do this. And it's anywhere from big companies to little ones. Like Automatic has 500 employees and they still find the time for this. And Reactive, they're only three developers but they still do it. So it doesn't even matter the size. It's, if it's important to your clients and that quality is really important to you, it's worth making the time for. And then as a developer, I think we can just all sleep a little better at night knowing that our code has been verified by someone else, that you know, when you go to do a deploy, when you go to push, a code, uh, push code to a client site or push a plugin, like you know that another developer has verified it, looked at it, everything works really well and you can just sleep like a, a cute little koala bear. Um, so next, I wanted to kind of talk about some of the things that you can look for when you're doing code reviews. Like if you're a reviewer going through, what should you actually find and try and tease out of the code when you're doing one of these reviews? But something I wanted to talk about as an intro to this, and I think this discussion is very important in code reviews, is the concept of a dictatorial versus conversational code review. So you'll notice as I go through these, that all of them are phrased as questions. And that's very, very intentional. Because a conversational code review, which is something that's more friendly, it's more inclusive, it's more, I want to know why you had this thought process. You might try doing this. Um, here's some documentation. Uh, this, return, this function will return something a little different. Is a lot different, that conversational kind of discussion. And, and those kind of comments are a lot different from, you did this wrong. This needs to be fixed. This can never be pushed to a client site. Like that's a dictatorial kind of thing. You're telling someone that something is wrong, as opposed to having a discussion with them on how they can improve their code, how they can do it better, or why they approach something. Because as a reviewer, you don't know the thought process that they took to get there. And there might be some reasons for why they're doing that. So the first question, and probably the one that most people pay the most attention to, is does this code actually work? Right? Like As you're doing the code review, doing a functional testing on it, following all the logic through on a feature and making sure that everything goes through correctly and that you're not going to miss any variables, you're not going to cause any 500 errors, or you're not going to throw any issues on a client site. That's probably the number one thing, right? You've got to watch for that first of all. And then 
beyond that, this is kind of like the flip side of that coin, but how can I break this? So instead of just a complete, utter, complicit trust that something will always work when you go through, like approaching it with that, looking at it from the perspective of, like, if they added a function, if you use this function in a completely different area of the code base, will it still work? Like, if you're relying on looped, um, looped functions and you have to have a post set up, what happens when you need to use that in another place? Like, should you pass an ID in instead? Like, looking at it with a little skepticism and trying to break it before it gets to the client site will help prevent those bugs even a little further. Is this code readable? Um, the stylistic aspects are really important because this relates specifically to, like, to the maintainability of a project. And what you're looking for here is, like, if you as a reviewer, so the person who didn't wrote th write this code, had no context, so you didn't have an issue to look at, you didn't have a bug to report or any context around this code, you had to go in and fix this in one year. Would you understand it? Would you be able to read it and, and see the reasons why they did what they did? And if you couldn't, like if you were to put yourself in that situation and you couldn't do that, then maybe they need to may pay more attention to the standards, like sty uh, stylistic standards. Maybe there needs to be some extra documentation in there. Um, maybe renaming some of the variables or the functions would make a lot of sense and kind of help out, make this a lot clearer. Um, how could this be more performant? So maybe um, can you like cache some output in the object cache instead of passing it straight through every time? Can you um, make a query a little bit more performant? Are there going to be any memory, like, um, what's the word for that? In JavaScript, uh, are you going to cause any memory leaks by running this JavaScript? Like, in the CSS, is it going to lag if you scroll down the page? Like, kind of asking yourself these questions as you go through, especially in the maintenance stage of a project, where you can kind of get bogged down in, like, just fixing bugs, just changing things, like, um, instead of that focus on performance, teasing that out in the code reviews will help keep things really quick. quick. Um, and then the security aspects, and this one's a really big one, because humans are far better than any bot or any code standards review or any code sniffer at, P at kind of teasing out and pulling out security issues. Because a human can follow code contextually throughout the entire application. Like, you can look in multiple different functions or through all the methods in a class and see where something has escaped, or if there's a non-standard sanitization function, um, or if you're cleaning some variable in another place, whereas a bot will just say, hey, X is missing on this line. So looking through and making sure that all the outputs are escaped, um, asking yourself if all the inputs are sanitized, are you allowing any, like, JavaScript maybe to be pushed through, um, like, a user input? Should some of this code maybe be locked down only to logged in users and only to certain permissions? Kind of asking these questions will help lock down the security. And then the last one here is, um, has this been fixed in every place in the code base? And this is probably a little bit of a non-standard question. But what I've noticed is that a lot of developers see an issue, see a bug, see something reported, and they just go, hmm, I know what that is. I know exactly where it's gone wrong. I'll fix it, I'll push it up, be a hero, this will be crazy fast. And then they ignore the four other places in that code base where that code is duplicated or where that function is used, and they never adjusted that part of the code base to make sure that it worked. So if you're doing a review, just doing a search all in the whole project to make sure that they're covering all the same places and variables and making sure that if, like, if they're modifying the return on a function, is that function used somewhere else? Is it going to break anything else in the application? Is it going to cause any more issues? So next, um, how does this actually work in real life? So this is probably what most of you guys came for. Um, this is a basic organization and a basic process how, that we do it at Human Made. And every client's a little different. You know, the namings end up a little different. But this is a base workflow that we have when we kind of start a project for pulling out the particular places of doing a code review and some of the tools we use. So the first one is a thing called GitFlow. And Gitflow is a branching uh, methodology or organization, you could, you could say. And basically, it, it delineates which branches you use in certain situations, where you would branch off of those, so create whole new branches for features or bug fixes, and then where you would do a code review in, the, in that entire process. So, uh, oh. yeah, all right, cool. So the first one is master. And this is kind of going over time. So if you see from the left to the right, we're going to follow through a couple features as we build them in our fake application here. So master, this is like the default 
basic branch you get with any Git repo. And you know you have a basic one on, on subversion, I believe, as well. And this branch is going to be your production-ready branch, right? This branch is sacred. This is a branch that you could do a deploy off of, you could do a build off of, you could, at any time, if all your site files went away, you could rebuild the site with the files in this because it's on parity with what's on the live site. So it's production ready, this one. So we're not gonna pull any code straight off this generally, unless we're doing a hot fix. We're not gonna just cowboy code anything into this. For that, we're gonna use a branch called develop, um, which could also be staging, for example. There's many different names for this. But this is kind of your playground branch, right? This is where you can pull any code off of, you can push anything into this if you need to, and this is where we'll branch off for individual features. But this could possibly be a little broken. So you can play around with it until you merge it back in. So you can see over time this comes straight off master, and eventually as we go on, it'll go back into master over time. And then we're, um, maybe I should try this. And then where Gitflow really comes in is a thing called feature branches. So feature branches are a single feature or a single bug fix, and it's very granular, it's very modular. So that'll come off of develop and it'll go back into develop. So you can see here we just have feature one, it's some random feature, a couple commits, and then we're gonna ask to put that back into develop. And that's where our code reviews are gonna happen. So you'll probably have several features over the lifetime of an application. Man, it does not like my images. Um, so you'll have a couple features over the lifetime of the application, and you know we have feature one, feature two, feature three. And you can see at each of these, before that code gets pushed back into that main code base at develop, it's, you're gonna have a code review right there. And that's where in GitHub we'll do a pull request, which I'll talk about in a minute. And you can see eventually we get a couple features, we'll merge that back into master periodically. So once it's tested and proven, you basically create packages that you can push back up to the website. And then, oh, dang it, I thought I wasn't gonna do it. Um, and then the hot fix, which come, there we go. So and then the hot fix, and this is where keeping master on parity at all times, like keeping it really clean, comes in handy. So if the client calls you at 3 a.m. in the morning and says, hey, something's wrong, I need this fix right now, can we fix this? You can always do a build off of master, do a hot fix, and push that back into master after you get a code review. So that's kind of like the basic organization that we handle for most repositories. So let's look at how the basic main process actually looks. So first, we'll build a feature or bug fix in a feature branch, kind of like what we talked about. We'll pull that off of developer staging or whatever that is and do a couple commits, test it locally, and then we'll open up a pull request. For us, this is on GitHub, but you can do the same thing on Bitbucket. I think you can do it on GitLab. You can do patches in subversion, basically, how whatever method or tool you're using, you have a, a way of doing this. So on GitHub, it's pull requests and request a review. And for us at Human Made, labels and pinging people are really important. They're the primary way that we let people know that something is ready for a review, and so that's why I kind of have these labels underneath each of these. So then a developer can come along, you ping someone, it's got a review label, you know how this looks. Um, come along, leave feedback or approve it, one way or the other. And that feedback process on GitHub would look something like this. Um, that. So this is a diff on GitHub. And as you can see right here, so we have some white above and below. That's kind of like the contextual. It'll open up a few lines above and below every diff that you change when you push something in a pull request. And then this green bit here, that means that we've added something to this code base, or we want to add something. If you're pulling something out, the whole line will be a red background instead. So as you're going through as a reviewer, it's very easy to see what's been changed and how each and every single one has been changed. So in here, you can hopefully, have guys have seen a couple issues with this code. Um, and we have this little plus icon here. So as a reviewer, you're going through and you can hover over a line and add a contextual comment to just that line. So that when the original developer goes back in and you add a comment, it will look something like this. So on line 21, we have a bad if check. This is never really gonna work correctly. So I've left a comment on this saying, hey, this doesn't look right. You might wanna try this instead because this is gonna actually catch what you want it to catch. And the cool thing about this is that even if you have 100 comments on this, like on this code, like say it's, it's got a lot of issues on it. Each one is broken down individually, 
So when the developer goes back in to review that and see what you said about their code, they can see each individual part and they can fix that as they go through. And then the cool thing is, once you've actually pushed this code, um, once you've fixed the issue as a developer and push it back up, this comment gets collapsed and it goes away. So you can actually see your progress through, see what you fixed by looking at this uh, pull review page on GitHub. So back to the process, the developer will review, they'll approve or send back. And this might happen a couple times, this might be in a circle. Um, you know, sometimes if you're pushing in a lot of code at once, then you're gonna go through a couple different rounds. And that's pretty normal, right? Like, at Human Made, it's actually pretty rare for any of us to get code in the very first time unless it's a really small change. So a lot of, I think a lot of people kind of come into this process, have this expectation that, ah, oh, I'm, like, I'm perfect, this is absolutely perfect code, we'll get it right through. But the process is to tease out any issues at all. So sometimes it'll happen a couple, like you'll go through this process a couple of times. And then once it's all good, they'll approve, they'll send it back and then they'll merge back into develop or staging or whatever branch that you're gonna use for this. So that's pretty much it actually. It's a really simple process and a lot of it is based around that organization and how you handle your repositories. Um, hopefully you guys uh, got some good tips out of this and hopefully got some inspiration on, on doing these code reviews in your companies. Thank you very much for your time. Um, do we have any questions? Um, yeah, for the, um, the hot fixes, you don't do any code reviews, or how do you do that? We do do code reviews for hot fixes, yeah. And how do you find the time for developers, or if they're busy, you're like, you need to fix this now, and the client is on the phone, and yeah. he's angry, and then you have to... Uh, we ping someone. So even if they're not in the project, we'll ping someone, say, hey, I need this code review right away. And generally, there's someone available to do that code review. If there's a sense of urgency around it, um, people will come to that and kind of rise to the challenge. But yeah, especially for hot fixes too, because when you're under stress and when there's a matter of urgency, you're a lot more likely to make some mistakes. So that's even more important there, I would say. Yeah. Hey, hey. Um, after the initial commit, when you start a new project, uh -huh. uh, when do you start with code reviews? Um, so, Pretty much right off. So just about everything that we build is custom. So even if we're doing a brand new project, um, it might take a little while for a complete feature to come into the theme or a complete feature to come into a plugin. But as soon as that is ready to submit, we will do that. But basically from the first line of code that we write, everything goes through. Now that doesn't include core, but if we wanna put any plugins in there that haven't already been re reviewed, like, I mean, we actually, we've reviewed Yoast SEO, we've reviewed every plugin that goes into a client site. So anything after we start that first project will get reviewed. It m just might be so big that it takes a week or two to actually get to the review stage. Is that? Okay, so how many developers do you have on a project? Oh, the problem that I find is, you know, you've got different issues, we're all working on smaller projects, so it doesn't mm -hmm. require a big change to the theme. Yeah or whatever the plugin or the, the you're creating. So it's not like a huge feature, but you need to still have it, you have it co quickly coming in and you end up having like loads of pull requests and. Yeah, no, it's very possible. Um, so I mean, our projects vary wildly from having just one developer all the way up to six developers. But like I said, if there's one developer alone on a project, they'll just ping someone in another project for a review. So there's kind of cross pollination between them or sometimes we'll assign a code review seat. So even if someone isn't working on a project actively, they can still provide code review for that project. Um, and it's, it's definitely hard to find the time to make this work, but it's, I mean, it's very much worthwhile. So even if you only have one developer on a, on a project, you can kind of pull resources from other ones as needed. So would you just do a weekly then code review of the, like do a weekly pull request? Would it be per feature, that, or you'd really try to do it per feature? Really try to do it per feature. And the reason for that is that it'll actually make those code reviews far faster. So even if there's 20 code reviews, that would be this equivalent amount of code as one code review. If they're individual features and really small, someone who's experienced can just rocket through those and really tear through them fast. Because there's a very clear understanding of what that feature in code is supposed to do. Um, so I would still do it per feature if possible. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, we have one last question from the man. 
right there. Hi. Hi. So this is more like synchronous or asynchronous process. I know that the human mind is really distributed team. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Um. I think that preferably yeah. it should be synchronous process, live one. Yeah. But. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It really depends on the project and how fast we can get people to do it. Um, I think if I understand your question, basically every time we do a code review, like someone will be able to hop onto it pretty quickly. But if we have a really big project, it might take a little while for someone to get to that. Um, like one of our biggest projects, it can easily take a couple days for someone to get to it because there's so many code reviews. But there's an understanding with the client why that's happening and for what reason, and so that'll slow it down. But um, Generally synchronous, I would say. So developer, uh, developer needs to push someone. Just ask always. Review my, co my code. Review my code. Yeah. Or have some process in built where someone goes through every day, or like I was telling um, him that there is a code review seat assigned to that, and they're responsible for doing that. And so if someone has to bug another person constantly, there's probably a breakdown in that code review seat or the process. So putting some constraints and guides around that will help um, make the rules really clear and definitive. Yeah, thanks. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we need to round up. If right. you have more questions, uh, you can always catch him yeah. afterwards. Uh, so thank you, Mike, for your nice talk. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, so we have one last talk, and it's in Swedish in here. Uh, so if you're an English-speaking person, or at least don't understand. Ah, it's in English, sorry. Uh, so it's in English here. Don't flee. Don't run away in panic. Uh, in the other room, there will be a talk called Building Elobina's Texture Revolution in WordPress by Magnus. And in here, there will be a talk uh, in Swedish. It's called Anvend WordPress API och React för att nå överallt, which in English would be something like use the WordPress API and React to reach everywhere. And it's Matthias Ekendal. So in a few minutes, we'll have uh, Matthias up on stage. <laughs>